year, a group of people constructed a Viking longship and named it Diflin, the subject of a Hans documentary. Dublin's Dockland is made up of three great walls, the North Wall, the South Wall and the East Wall. The gateway to the heart of East Wall are Ansley Bridge on the River Talca, the Five Lamps, the Point Session Building and the East Link Bridge. Inside the gates, you're in Sean O'Casey country with memories of the great St Barnabas Church and its friendly rector. The land between the Liffey and the Talca was reclaimed in the late 19th century. And as the port of Dublin developed, the East Wall community grew. Like their sister neighborhood over in Ring's End, the people's lives were built around ships and shipbuilding, Liffey dockyards, railways and railway wagons, coal boats and cargo vessels. And later came chocolate factories, candle factories, sawmills, builders' yards and shops. Is in the character and backbone of a city made up with its old urban communities. These shops were in Church Road when I was a chiseler, delivered in the laundry in the 1940s. All the same now, does in Dublin Corporation employ very young people to sweep the streets. There's a man with Viking longships on his mind, Joe Teeling. Within the community, we had this incredible urge to build a Viking ship. Uh, it would be an opportunity for us to express the dormant talents and skills that lay within our community. And it would also be a chance to do something for the millennium although the millennium wasn't considered in the early stages, but now it would be uh, of great importance if we could build a ship uh, to, commemor to commemorate our history and our past in conjunction with Millennium Year. The project got started uh, with Patsy Whelan, uh, who built the skiffs for us down in our local uh, water sports club. Now, Patsy was a local boat builder. He was one of quite a number of local boat builders who could very easily work with children and was delighted to be working with us on the skiff project. And he was explaining to the young people about the relationship between the clinker built method of building boats and the old Viking ships. And the idea then was tossed to him, would he be able to build a Viking ship? And of course he said, Joe, if you get the materials, I'll build a Viking ship. Unfortunately, Patsy Whelan took ill and, and passed on on us, and the Viking ship had to be shelved for a period of time. So Paddy Carroll up in Coolock was mentioned to me, and he was now in Coolock, but originally from Eastwall, uh, from an, again a long line of boat builders down in Eastwall. And when he was approached, he said, like Patsy Whelan, almost the very same words, if you get the timber, Joe, I'll build your Viking ship. It became very clear and very evident early in the actual project the capacity of this man's skills. I think there was no aspect or area of the ship that he hadn't examined. Now, whether this was his birthright due to the fact that he belonged to a long line of shipwrights from East Wall, or whether it was due to the man's own intelligence, but his incredible knowledge of the entire ship and ships in general and engineering and all aspects of boat and boating carried this whole project through to the, to the last and he had the respect of every man and boy on the shop floor it, it was a wonderful experience the vikings came up the river liffey in the year 795 and fell in love with dublin they came to rob our gold and silver but clever dublin the old blackpool the old balliot 
the ford of hurdles, robbed their hearts and cast her spell and made them stay. By the year 841, the Vikings had the foundation laid for their houses, their trade walks, and sure the port of Dublin was their gateway to the world. When the National Museum excavated High Street, Wine Taverton Street and Wood Quay, they found Viking treasures that had lain undisturbed for centuries, preserved by the mud of the Blackpool. Combs and coins, jugs and medals, motif pieces on bone used at a patron book, and bits of old boots that walked Dublin in Viking days. Dices and gaming pieces were also found. So the Vikings had a gamble, an old flutter, and maybe a lot old like ourselves. Now, was that one Viking showing another Viking how to make a longship, or was it a chiseler drawn on a slate? Oslo Fjord on the coast of Norway. Can't you imagine the Viking longships slipping out of here on the tide on their wild, adventurous sea journeys? Now, Joe Teeling and Paddy Carroll have made the reverse journey to plunder Viking longship knowledge. King Olaf's palace in the heart of Oslo looking down over Karl Johan's gat. If those lovely girls' ancestors had a stayed in Dublin, they might well be walking down O'Connell Street today. There's two East Wall Vikings. Don't they blend in well with the Norwegians? Our East Wall Viking heroes are about to launch an attack on the famous Gottstad longship. It was excavated in the summer of 1880. Kings, queens, princesses and wealthy jars were buried with their ships. The unique blue clay of Norway preserved the Gottstad for posterity. Now in the care of Dr. Arne Emil Christiansen of Oslo University. Look at the size of that piece of timber there. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know where we get that, you know, what kind of a tree. Well, I thought yeah. you had good oak forests in Ireland. No, Better no. than ours, at least. No. Nothing, nothing, just so is. No, I think it, England depleted all, uh, all our forests during the Spanish War. I think the mm. field alone will take, you know, 68 feet, is it? 68 mm -hmm. feet. It's mm -hmm. about 18 meters metric, 18 meters, so, yeah. And then you would need a huge piece of oak for the stem, too. Yeah. And well, I'd say the Vikings had to chop down half the trees in Norway to build this ship, you know. Yes, mm. you, you'll have to look around to get a good oak with the curve for the stem. Yeah. Paddy wants to find out how they steered the ship. Yeah. Big lump of timber, huh? This ribs has a spring, yeah. sprinkling piece at the back the where, the, where the boss rests, so the stresses are taken up and it's jogged to fit the planking. It looks like that was made out of a, a big knot. Yes, it's, it's prob a probably knot. a knot with, the, yeah. with part of the trunk to, to sit on. Yeah, because that would be sharp, right? But it was moving it. The oak forest in the Devesi estate in Abbey Leaks. If you go down to the woods today, you might find the makings of a good Viking longship. You get 22, 23 feet up to that first fork on the left. Yeah. What do you think, James? You, also, you would also get a section of the bell piece there, up there, John. Yeah. That? You keep that round, John. Yeah. Just get a section there. I would just get a little under three feet. 
Well, let's look at these big ones over here. There's a couple of large ones. As Joe Thielen searched for ancient Irish oak, he penned a verse or two. His keen eye scans the lofty tree. He reads it like a book. Stem and stem, post, knees and frame, he sees within its crook. With surging hands, he feels the bark, so strange and yet so real. His touch will sound the saplings as he senses out the keel. All outward signs of the bark is uh, healthy. None of the Viking timber was cut this way. All their ships were built of cleft oak split with wooden and metal wedges. This is the O'Brien sawmill on the edge of the Devesi estate. The oldest oak tree in Ireland grows here. It's over 500 years old. Its grandchildren fell today were planted when Napoleon was on the high seas. This whole wonderful project began like the acorn beneath the mighty oak. It had small beginnings. At first everyone said no to Joe Thielen, and then like a miracle it all began. The Department of Forestry said they'd give the timber, the ESB said they'd carry it, the Port and Docks Board gave the shift shed, and on and on came the sponsors and the volunteers. Now it was November 1987 and Paddy Carroll and a shipbuilding team had deadlines to meet so no time was wasted getting organised. In the best shipwrights tradition and with the finest skills the oak keel was laid and the guides erected to give shape to the ship around which the strakes would be built. As well as the team of shipbuilders, many people gave help in kind by lending machine tools and equipment and by becoming sponsors in one way or another. As the work progressed, one thing became clear. This was no skiff. This was no canoe. This was the Diffland longship with an overall length of 23 metres and it would take over 2,000 metres of timber to build her. <laughs> the Gutstead was built of oak from stem to stern, but as Paddy Carroll said, you'd have to cut down every forest in Ireland today to get enough oak. So it was decided to use large for the strakes the shipwright's terms for the planks